When I was a teenager, I came across a little book that changed my life, the Fireside Book of Deadly Diseases. It was jam-packed with tales of how infectious diseases like leprosy, tuberculosis, and syphilis have changed our world. From there, I started reading more about the Black Death or plague, most likely caused by a bacterium called Yersinia pestis. The plague killed millions of people all around the world during the 14th century. I was hooked. All I could think about was, how do these almost invisible, microscopic creatures cause such havoc in the human body? And how can we stop them? Now, I'm an academic a university lecturer and a scientist working for the New Zealand taxpayer. My research is trying to understand how infectious microbes evolve to make us sick and to try and discover new medicines to stop them in their tracks. But today I want to talk a little about what the scientific process is and how it works in practice for scientists like me. First, we need to have an idea, a hypothesis that we want to test. In my lab, one of our current hypotheses is that native New Zealand fungi are a source of new antibiotics. The next step is to raise the money we need to run our experiments, usually by writing grants to government funding agencies and charities. If we can get the money, we can go ahead and start testing our hypothesis. In reality, this step is one of the hardest, with many great ideas going unfunded because there just isn't enough money to go around. But after raising the money, it's time to get on with the science. And here's the thing, humans are masters of self-deception. Our brains evolved to jump to plausible conclusions as a matter of survival. This talent, combined with our tendency to find patterns where there are none, and our appetite for being right, can lead us astray. The scientific method is all about putting our human nature aside so it doesn't influence how we design our experiments or interpret their results. As a scientist looking for new medicines that kill infectious microbes, it doesn't matter at first if I don't understand how these new medicines might work. What does matter is that I don't let my desire for them to work influence the results of the experiments. The way we get around this is often referred to as blinding. It's best not to know what we're testing until the results have been analysed. Once we have our data, we then go about telling other scientists what we found by presenting at conferences and writing up our usually most exciting results for publication in a scientific journal. For university scientists like me, these published articles are the currency of research and they play a huge role in our career success and our ability to get funding. This encourages scientists to keep their work a secret until they're ready to publish, for fear that someone else might beat them to it. And not everything we've done will end up being published. Journals don't generally like publishing negative results. That means that dead ends and false leads usually end up hidden away in a lab book on a dusty shelf. To decide whether to publish our research, Journals send our manuscripts to usually two or three other scientists who have to decide if they agree with the methods we used and our interpretation of the results. This is called peer review and it's where we find out if we've been barking up the wrong tree or doing our experiments all wrong. It can also be where we find out we've wasted precious time and resources. Peer review is done for the journals by academics for free. If our manuscript passes peer review, it'll then be published in the scientific literature for others to read and use, whether that's another scientist doing research, a doctor deciding which medicine they want to prescribe, or a civil servant developing new policies for government. In my field of research, journals charge us a fee to publish our manuscripts, usually based on how long they are and how many color images they contain. This fee can be several thousand dollars. The majority of journals also charge a fee to read each of the articles they've published, which can be as much as $50 for 24 hours access online. Put another way, academics work for scientific journals for free, doing peer review and acting as editors. The journals then charge scientists to publish those peer-reviewed manuscripts and anyone who wants or needs to read them. In fact, universities in New Zealand and around the world spend millions of dollars each year subscribing to academic journals to access the results of taxpayer-funded research. Scientific publishing is big business. In 2013, Elsevier, one of the major publishers of academic journals, made almost 40% profit. That's more than Apple. Frustrated by the stranglehold that these highly profitable publishing companies have on the results of scientific research, 
In 2003, a group of academics founded their own not-for-profit publishing company. This is called the Public Library of Science, or PLOS for short. Like traditional journals, articles submitted to PLOS journals are peer-reviewed by academics, and researchers are also charged a fee to publish their work. But once published, articles are free for anyone to read. This is called open access and aims to make the results of science accessible to all who want or need to read them. That's you, your doctors and nurses, your politicians, and the thousands of researchers working in countries whose universities can't afford to spend millions of dollars subscribing to journals. As a scientist, open access means that my research isn't limited by me only being able to read articles in the journals that my university subscribes to. With open access, I have access to everything that's relevant. Now, open access is great, but to truly accelerate the pace of scientific research and to save precious time and resources, what would be even better would be for the whole process of science to be open. I often wonder how many scientists have arrived at the same dead ends as I have? How many times have I repeated experiments that have already failed for someone else? In other words, is there another way to do science? There is. In 2011, Germany experienced an outbreak of food poisoning with an unusually high rate of serious complications like kidney failure. Over a two month period, almost 4,000 people became ill and more than 50 people died. While Europe bickered over the potential source of the outbreak, scientists were working really hard to identify the culprit. They started by sequencing the genetic material of the bacterium responsible. But instead of analysing the DNA sequence behind closed doors, the Beijing Genomics Institute released the full sequence of the outbreak strain onto the internet to the international community. This allowed anyone with the knowledge and tools to join in the race to decode the killer bacterium's DNA. Within days, scientists from all over the world had joined in the effort, collaborating via websites, blogs and social networks. It didn't take long for them to discover that the outbreak was caused by a strain of E. coli that had picked up a deadly toxin. Other scientists then used that information to develop a rapid way to diagnose new cases related to the outbreak, which they immediately provided free to any agency and research organisation that was working to control the disease. This is amazing. A growing number of scientists are beginning to explore this new frontier of open science making not just their papers open access, but their data and their methods too. Instead of their lab books gathering dust on a shelf, they're online and accessible to all. This means that all those dead ends and failed experiments are out there for others to learn from. And instead of waiting till the end of their experiments, these scientists are using online tools to discuss and collaborate with other researchers anywhere in the world to move the research forward in real time. Matt Todd, a chemist at the University of Sydney in Australia, started the Open Source Malaria Project, which is looking for new medicines to treat malaria. Malaria is an infectious disease spread by mosquitoes and it affects millions of people worldwide. The Open Source Malaria Project now has over 50 people from all over the world working on the project. Some offering advice and reagents, others doing experiments. Some of these people are scientists working at universities and companies, and some of them are high school students. Humanity faces some tough challenges in the years ahead. Climate change, antibiotic resistant superbugs, clean energy, food and water security. These 21st century problems need a science system that's fit to tackle them, not one that's stuck in the past. The way we do science now wastes precious time, resources and money. The way forward is open science.